So hello, everyone. Um, hopefully, you can hear me. And um, I'm not sure where the uh, Q&A, um, the uh, chat window went. <laughs> it vanished a minute ago. Um, so welcome to this uh, webinar. It's the first one uh, sort of uh, I've run and, uh, and Rachel's run. So um, I appreciate your uh, sort of willingness to be guinea pigs, I guess, uh, in this process. Um, sort of, my name's Dwayne, as uh, you uh, may or may not know, um, and uh, I've organized this with Rachel, um, partly to try and share some of her expertise as well, but also to help promote the training she's doing um, in July. And at the end of this, you'll be redirected to that uh, training page in case you want to sign up. So um, we will try and make it as interactive as possible, but uh, we're also limited by the technology and our experience with the technology. So um, just be a bit tolerant of that. So what I'll do now is um, I've, I'm actually physically here in the room with Rachel. Um, even though we've got all this technology, I figured that would be the best way to figure out how to make it work together. So um, she's, I'm going to pass it over to her in a second. Um, she's going to present to you about for half an hour of some of the best and worst emails of 2016. Um, and then we'll switch into more of a Q&A mode um, where we can um, discuss some of that as well. Um, I don't think there's the ability with this to actually have us all talking at once, um, but probably the chat mode is a bit easier to handle with that anyway, given the numbers. So we're about 19 people. We had 74 people sign up. So part of our experiment as well is um, how many people will actually show up that are originally booked to be on this. So um, that's, and I'll share all the stats of that afterward in the ECF list. So um, thanks for being here. And I will now pass over to, uh, to Rachel, and I'll switch it to uh, a listen-only mode. And uh, hopefully that will uh, sort of allow her to present. Um, Hello everyone. I'm Rachel Collinson, also known as the Donor Whisperer, and I have quite a lot of experience with digital media and I've been working with charities online for uh, nearly as long. Um, my clients include Greenpeace, Oxfam, Fair Trade Foundation, the Stroke Association, and many, many more. Um, I run training sessions and I provide consultancy, including board games and card games, to help increase your organization's capacity to reach new supporters. And also, you know, if you have a, an email list or a database that appears to be slowly dying, then um, I can help you uh, deepen the relationships with people on, on that list. I'm just going to turn my mobile off in case it uh, is interfering. And I'll let Dwayne run through a bit of his experience and, and skills. Hi, I think most of you um, know a bit of me anyway, so, but uh, I've been doing this for quite a few years. Um, sort of uh, started really professionally in this area working with Oxfam, um, doing their e-campaigning back in 2001 to 4. Um, I work, of course, with a lot of great charities, including um, probably some of your organizations as well. Um, but always learning, always trying to um, sort of try and do new things, which is why this webinar is there. And uh, we'll see how it goes. So um, thanks, thanks for coming along. Okay, so uh, let's dive in. Now, uh, if you see any blurred out or whited out text uh, in, in some of these emails, it's so that I can, uh, we can protect the guilty uh, from their mistakes. We've all made mistakes. I certainly have with emails, and uh, I wouldn't want to be any, any more embarrassed than I already am about those. So uh, first, we're going to look at the, some of these emails uh, we're not going to look at all of these, but just we're going to see them like this as, as though they're in somebody's inbox. Now, 
what is so important about writing good email is first of all getting the sender and the subject line and the timing right so we can't look at the timing now but certainly the sender and the subject line are absolutely crucial to getting your emails opened so the first one on this list while it comes from a known individual which is a really good tactic uh, it has the formidable subject line of uh, the local, the name of the local Labour Party that's sending it, plus e-newsletter 10 June 2016. Now, this immediately puts me off. There's no clue to what kind of content is in it. It's the same as the previous e-newsletter I got from them and the one before and the one before that. And I already know the date because my email programme tells me what it is. So I think this is unfortunately a, a very poor subject line and it's one that I see all the time. Uh, the other disadvantage to it is that it's very long. So in my email inbox, I can't see the first few letters of the text, which might tell me that they might tease me with the content, which I might want to read. So the next one um, from Dermot in WWF Australia uh, is a very good one an extremely short subject line which means that it jumps out in the inbox it's not a lot of information to take in those are all words of one syllable and it's a boy immediately I want to open it just out of curiosity uh, who's given birth um, where are the photos the cute baby photos I want to see that uh, I'm getting some love from uh, from Australia here. This is great. <laughs> um, and now the only problem with this is that in Gmail, at least, we see uh, baby rhino rectangle .jpg, which rather gives the game away. So I presume that's some alt text that is appearing as email text, uh, which really shouldn't be in there. You know, we should see. Uh, Dear Rachel, it's a boy. I'm so excited. And whatever came next so that when I open the email, I get a nice surprise. So the, the following one, uh, Taryn, I would imagine is quite well known to all of you. And the subject line is Pulse Nightclub. Now, this is a really good tactic to use to increase your open rates, and that is to mention current events. I would imagine that this email got a very high number of opens from their from their supporters. Now it's followed up with warning trigger alert. This may be very difficult to read, which while being very helpful and considerate for people who have suffered violence and may be suffering from um, post-traumatic stress disorder, this actually, as someone who managed to overcome those things, is perversely enticing. Now, I wouldn't advise this as a tactic, but it does really compel me to open the email and see what Taryn, who I respect a great deal, might be saying about the Orlando shooting. Following up with that, we have another, another email, one of the bad ones, I'm afraid to say, um, which I've had to blur rather a lot out because it would otherwise give away the uh, the organization. Now, um, it uses the name of their organization and says is setting the agenda. And that's not exciting to me at all. I want to know me and things that are relevant to me, not to your organization. And that is just, you know, it, it feels like boasting. And at least as a Brit, that, that turns me right off. Uh, following that, uh, we have a, an email from an organisation. So there's no there's no named person. It's simply a an organisation name, and that uh, again, I when I get emails, I often like to say that email is a frighteningly intimate medium. People will say to you in email things that they wouldn't say even in person. 
So to have an email from an organisation immediately, to me at arm's length, it's not intimate in something which I'm expecting intimacy from. The next thing, urgent request for support at AWE Bergfield. I have no idea what that is, despite being a supporter myself of this organisation. Uh, and, I, and I think urgent is good. It's a great word to use in your email subject line, as long as it genuinely is urgent and you're not you're not faking someone out. Um, I sometimes use urgent in capital letters and a colon and that always gets a response, but it does it does have to be urgent. Now here, uh, they've blown that all um, by saying request for support at something that I don't know what it is. And, and I don't know why they need my support. And so they really lost that opportunity to engage me. And then following this, we have one from Ben Cohen at Tear Fund, who, who is actually here, uh, if you want to ask him any questions as well. Uh, and the, the subject line is after Blue Monday, Thankfulness Tuesday. So this was sent a couple of days after Blue Monday, which is officially the most depressing day of the year in January, when apparently the uh, rates of uh, depression and suicide peak. Uh, and it's so many days after Christmas and the time of the year when people are most in debt. So the subject line is trying to uh, relate to that and relate to how people might be feeling down and uh, encouraging thankfulness, which is, you know, it's rather nice. It's very topical. It mentions days in the email, which is known to be a, a factor that helps people click. So now we've looked at what you know what what is good and bad about the sender a name and the subject line we're going to move on to the uh, the worst email uh, one of the worst emails that i've seen i can't say i could i've seen them all uh, there are tens of thousands of charity emails sent so far this year uh, but this is this is just one of them i've picked up on so this is the email with the subject line uh, urgent support requested at AWE Bergfield. Now, again, the lack of personalization going on here is a big problem with this email. I'm not even addressed by name uh, and there's no distinct person who's writing to me, which is so, so crucial for getting a response from an email, especially in the nonprofit sector. Uh, I have I have no idea who Trident Plowshares are or what they do, um, and it's only part way through the email that I get to understand why this is important. And but it's it, it's communicated in in words that are long. It's a you know it's not an email that is a joy to read. Uh, there are no people mentioned in it. You know, it would be nice to have a photo of people blockading the uh, the Aldermaston base, or a story about a, a campaigner who has been heroic there that I might want to join. The other problem with it is that there's too many things to do. So we have click here for more information. Click here to see the Guardian's coverage. And then we have information, a mass lobby of parliament, contacting my MP, uh, and then become a member, make a donation, and the organization's shop. Just, there's too much here. There's no clear response mechanism. So we often talk about a call to action. So the call to action here is get more information or read more about it when surely what you'd want to do is ask people to reply to the email if they want to help. That's the most immediate and quickest way that you can get support supporters to respond to you rather than going through an impersonal website or a response form, which sometimes you may have to do due to sheer volumes. But uh, with, a, with a more local issue like this, I would imagine that um, 
localizing it would make that a lot easier. So this is another thing about the email that kind of pushes me away from this organization is I have no idea where Bergfield is. And that suggests to me that I'm not in the local area that this relates to. So if this email had been sent to people who live around Aldermaston or within uh, half an hour's traveling distance, then it would have been much more effective. And when you mention a person's local area in an, in an email, either in the subject line or early on in the message, it's far more likely to get a good response. So this email could certainly have been improved if I hadn't actually got it and it had been sent to people in that particular area. Um, but I, I certainly would suggest if there's if there's anyone from this organisation here, um, uh, my apologies, uh, you could you could make this far stronger if you if it was from a an activist in that area, for example, with a photo and a personal plea from the heart uh, to say how you joining could could really help. <coughs> so uh, next and and rather importantly. Uh, this is how it looks on mobile. So where you see gaps, it's because I've uh, I've centered the, uh, censored the email, um, and uh, it's not too bad. However, view this email in your browser link at the top there is so prominent, and it really shouldn't be. Uh, I, I think that the days when that was necessary are basically gone now and if you've if you've got a decent responsive template you can do away with that um, however if you if your IT department insists that it should remain uh, then um, it should be it should be a bit less prominent so uh, too much space is taken up with the the giant logo um, which is not even the name of the organization and the fact that they are championing an e-campaign, it just doesn't make sense these days. And so, you know, 80% of the screen here is taken up with bits and bobs to do with technology or the organization's proudness or the title. And there's only a meager 20% that I can see here, which is actually the the meat and potatoes of the email and all that it is is uh it's not about me it's about the organization sending congratulations to someone else who i don't know who they are so this would have been much much improved if the the template didn't spend didn't devote so much space to uh desktop systems and also personalized it to me and reduce the prominence of that strange logo. So having seen the uh, a bad example, let's have a look at uh, one of the best. And this is uh, WWF Australia. And it's the it's a boy email. And I know that some of you who work with international development organizations or medical charities uh, or um, anti-poverty charities may be groaning at this point because it's so easy to get an email to work when you have cute animals. However, uh, humans give birth too. So this is, this is something to remind yourselves of. Everyone not only likes to see cute rhinos, but cute babies. Um, so it's, this email centers around a very human thing, uh, a, a kind of genetic instinctual response to who someone or some or an animal being born. And it's one of those events that everybody likes to hear about, uh, even even if it's a stranger, it's, you know, the curiosity factor. Um, so what I like about this email is the, you know, it leads in from something very human and very personal to a wider issue and it's, it's definitely a, a feel-good factor email because it's uh, not only is it a birth story it's 
the story of an endangered species and some really, really good news for that species. And this email is about me. It says that I helped to make this happen, which makes me feel so good. Uh, now, please ignore the yellow boxes in this. Um, that's the result of me screenshotting after I searched for the email in my box. So uh, that's my mistake. It's not actually part of the design of the email. Um, so we have a we have a lovely quote from uh, from one of the support workers. Um, the, actually, the country representative. And you know that's it is good. It's a good way to break up what otherwise would be quite a long email and keep me reading through it. So what else is nice is that it's a good news mail that actually encourages me to watch a video that gives me other information about the rhinos and reinforces the expert nature of WWF and the work they do to uh, conserve the, the rhino species. And on email, um, sorry, on mobile, you can see how compelling that short subject line becomes. Short subject lines usually work better than long ones. In all the split tests I've done, uh, short always beats long. Um, sometimes you may need a longer one to get all the information in, but generally try and keep your subject lines as short as possible because you create white space, which designers are well known for going on about, which draws the eye toward that subject line. And the cute animal photo is front and centre, as it should be. Perhaps a little bit too much space devoted to the, uh, the heading that we already know. Um, but there's enough text there to compel me to read the rest. So it mentions it mentions people like me. So it's not about WWF. This is about me, the supporter and the donor. So before we before we move on, does anyone have any comments or questions on the contrast between those two emails? We can move on and wait for questions and comments at the end, but feel free to uh, feel free feel free to ask and comment as we go. Uh, Dwayne is here to answer things and make suggestions, so don't feel that you're interrupting. So. Uh, Another bad example, centres around me, me, me. So uh, this is from a, a local local Labour Party, uh, which I've had, which I've blanked out. It is uh, the the layout for an email is is really not appropriate whatsoever. The problem is, if I want to read any of these single articles, what I have to do is scroll down and then scroll back up again, which is a terrible, terrible reading experience and means that most of the information so laboriously put into this email will be ignored. So the other thing is there's, there's just too many things to do. There's about nine articles in this email. Most people can cope with one. So 
if this month, uh, newsletter, which comes out about six times a year, was split up into one weekly email, uh, then this this local party would get far, far more clicks and interactions and people coming to help. It doesn't, another key problem with it is that it doesn't mention my name at all. It's all about labour. It's nothing to do with me. Uh, even when it says help, help Rosina Allen Khan become the next MP for Tooting, it doesn't say, Rachel, we need you, you, we need your help on polling day. It, it, it actually uses the passive tense, help is needed, which is, they've almost gone out of their way to make it not compelling. But this, you know, it's going to be a very close fought by election. Labour has a huge opportunity here. Uh, and, you know, it's something that if I were a Labour Party member, I would be straight down there. Uh, this thing, this article should be front and centre because it is so topical, it's so urgent and it's so exciting. So, as I scroll down, there's some, there's some really, there's some more really nice events here and compelling campaigns, but they're lost in the flow of the text. Uh, this is some, some really lovely content. We've got an interesting call to action from the University of Leicester to take part in a, an interesting experiment, which is also paid. Um, and, you know, it's something I would find fascinating to join in with, but because it's on page three years, I've had to scroll down, that will get lost. Uh, and, you know, meet Jeremy Corbyn and Ben Oakry really really super compelling event uh, and they, they don't even put Jeremy Corbyn's face in there you know that would be so compelling for me as a as a Labour supporter so uh, finally on mobile the the email uh, just breaks down um, we have the three columns still there. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't widen out to one column to enable me to read far easier on mobile. So, I have again. I have to scroll all the way down, and it's mostly lines of two words, uh, maybe three or four. So it, it's a frustrating reading experience. Uh, and the the subject line goes over two lines it's, it's just not very exciting uh, the redeeming factor is that it's from a known person uh, who you know if i were a member of of this local party would be uh, someone that i know personally so you know that that is that is a redeeming feature but the really uh, my advice to this local labor group would be um, ditch the complicated newsletter layout send one email a week instead uh, covering each of these things and then you can simplify your email template so that it's just uh, you know a very short header and, and a photo uh, and and then uses uses personalization to make it relate to me uh, and you know not all about the organization but about me as a supporter and how i can participate in these really exciting events So then we have, this is not necessarily in order of goodness, um, we have our number two um, of the best emails of 2016, uh, which is an email that focuses on the emotional connection between supporters and uh, the organisation. Not only that, but supporters and each other and supporters and staff. So uh, we're, we're trying to build up not just one relationship between uh, the supporter and the organisation, which can be broken, uh, 
But if we build up the other relationships, it's much more difficult if you feel attached to other supporters or a staff member, even if the organisation uh, hack you off or upsets you in some way, um, you'll still feel compelled to be part of that community. So how are Tier Fund doing this? Well, um, this email is the result of a campaign to uh, ask supporters to send messages of hope and encouragement to their workers in the field in different countries. So it focuses on uh, Blue Monday, the most depressing day of the year, and trying to cheer people up. So they've got people, they've got their supporters' mental health in mind, which is lovely. And so that's the first kind of warm, warm fuzzy I'm getting that um, Tier Fund is not just caring for uh, the people it supports in developing countries; it's caring for me as well. Um, that uh, that helps bring me. Um, in a kind of Pavlov's dog sort of way. Uh, when I see their email in my inbox, I know that I'm going to get a really good feeling in my tummy as a result of reading it. So that kind of thing uh, is, is reinforced by this email, which doesn't actually ask me to do anything. It's just giving me really, really good feelings. And I think of a relationship uh, between the supporter and the email list, it needs to be two way. The organisation has to be giving to me as a supporter, as well as asking me to contribute. And I think if I'm constantly asked for things, I will burn out and I will unsubscribe or ignore the emails, which I think is part of what the Olive Cook tragedy was all about, is that uh, there's not enough reciprocal giving from the organisation. This is a really simple and free way to do that. So uh, here we have a photo of Anna Chilvers, who is a, a tier fund worker. Uh, and she was the focus of the previous campaign to, um, to get tier fund supporters to write to their, their development workers. And it was a really emotional experience for her. So um, the email quotes messages from other supporters, which shows me as, as someone on the receiving end of an email that I'm actually not alone either. There are other people who uh, are giving their time to this organisation who are like me and um, are really caring and generous with their, with their time and their money when it comes to supporting Tier Funds workers. So reading their comments is encouraging for me too. And this is, this is my favourite bit of the email altogether. Uh, it shows the responses from workers of different cultures uh, in, in CAR, in Burma and Somalia, and shows the, uh, particularly this, uh, this email from uh, a lady called, a 14 year old girl, in fact, called Pebble, who wrote to a worker in Somalia. And uh, this, is, this is really emotional. It's um, a girl who is working towards her exams and she takes time off to write to this worker in Somalia. And um, we can, it, it's so easy when you're in the kind of virtual environment, you're getting emails, it doesn't feel real. So for, for the supporter to receive a handwritten reply in a photo is so, um, it's so unusual and very, very special. Uh, and I think the human stories that this email tells are, are so compelling. And it, uh, it, but it doesn't, despite this, it just doesn't ask me for anything. And um, one of the great things about this email is that it, uh, it elicited uh, a flood of positive responses from supporters, even though they weren't asked, they just wrote uh, out of, out of happiness, out of encouragement that this was going on. And uh, it's, it's very difficult to ignore this charity once you've, once you've read through this email. Um, and here's how it looks on mobile. So, uh, 
that quote, I think, could do with being smaller so that I can see more of the introduction to the email. Um, but that's it. I, I think it's a, you know, it's a good template. Uh, it, it focuses on this, uh, this thank you message from uh, the beneficiaries of Tier Fund and uh, the, one of a real message of encouragement from a supporter. So um, we have we have twenty minutes left now. So uh, there were two questions that have come yep. up so far. One is from Catherine Joyce, mm -hmm. um, and uh, she asks um, sort of on the Rhino email, the quote looks really nice, but would adding a background color affect the responsiveness? I've been told we should be keeping the background as simple as possible. Mm, that's a really good question. Um, let me open the slide so I can go back to it. Okay, so I presume you're referring to the white text on the black background. Uh, I, I think that kind of uh, rhythm in the email does make the quote stand out very, very strongly. Um, it's unexpected and it draws your eye to it. Uh, however, I have to say this email is not focused on uh, increasing the click-throughs. Uh, it is focused on getting people to open and read the story. So in a sense, uh, it, it doesn't matter if it puts people off from clicking. And it may be that people don't read that quote at all. Uh, I, I, I would imagine with this kind of um, white on black text that the main problem with it is not the colours but the font. Um, it's, that's actually a serif font which is very difficult to read on screen. And while it makes it looks beautiful, uh, I would imagine that's very difficult to read for uh, dyslexic recipients. Um, who are among the most numerous uh, neuroatypical respondents to emails. So, it, yeah, um, it's. It, I would say it's the font that's bad with that. And Tom was asking, what's the name of the font again? Oh goodness, uh, I I'm not that much of a font geek anymore. Uh, it looks like either Palatino or Georgia. But I can I can find out the exact name. It's it's, it's called the, the generic term for that kind of font is a is a serif font. It's where you've got little brackets at the edge of the letters. It makes it look uh, less less sharp. Um, and so is the best recommendation that a sans serif font? Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Do you have any comments on that, Dwayne? Uh, not the moment. No, I will. Uh, I'll mostly focus on getting questions fed to you, so I can do okay. one thing well. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Susan did have a question, um, and Susan's question—it just popped off the screen. Hopefully, I can get it back. Um, Susan's question was about the length of the email. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, so, do you have any thoughts around the length of emails? Mm, well. Uh... This is where I strongly, strongly encourage you to split test as much as you can between short and long, because in my split testing adventures, I found that sometimes shorter emails work far better, sometimes longer emails work far better. And my hunch about this is that if you have an extremely good copywriter, longer emails will always work better. If your copywriter is uh, average, then shorter emails usually work better. But you can hedge your bets by making sure that you have call to actions uh, at the very top of the email, in the middle and at the bottom. And that way you cover all your bases so that if someone is pushed for time or they're quite compulsive or they're a huge supporter and you say jump and they say how high, uh, you've got something for them to go to straight away. Whereas if your supporter is a bit more cerebral or timid or they, they just enjoy a jolly good story, then you have a call to action at the end for them. Or maybe they just take more convincing with different styles or different ways of putting across your, your message. 
So uh, I'm sorry I can't give you a definitive answer, but every list is different. Um, different organisations attract different types of people that can cope with different lengths of email. Okay, the next question is from Helen, and then we have another one after that as well from uh, from uh, Mary. Helen's question is, I've seen lots of organisations using bold text in their emails to highlight key points. Mm. Do you think that's effective? Mm. That is a very good question, and I have not actually split tested it. I know that a lot of the, it, it seems to be uh, almost mockable uh, among your, you know, uh, some of us, of ours, 38 degrees, because they use it all the time. And it's a, it's a technique that is taken from direct mail fundraising and direct mail sales, where they did a lot of split testing and found that bolding important points for people who don't want to read the whole thing draws their attention from one bolded point to another and construct a narrative that is basically like a short form version of the email. However, I am not sure how many organizations have properly split tested this in emails. So again, I would encourage you, uh, if you, you know, if, if you have someone in your organization who is questioning the use of bolded type, like you can see in this uh, WWF email, uh, do a split test and see which gets more results. If you've got kind of randomly bolded things versus, um, uh, versus plain type all the way through. And I'll just add one thing to that. So uh, Amelia Showwater from the um, sort of Obama 2010 campaign when she does her training, one of the things she mentions is they tried an ugly version of an email, oh, yes. which instead of having the bolding would do yellow highlighting over certain keywords and or perhaps over the click button, sort of over the click links and things like that. I've done that almost inadvertently here <laughs> so, so you could see how ugly it looks. Uh, they found that initially there was a rise in people uh, actually with the ugly email mm. um, actually uh, clicking on it. That might have been because the yellow link. Um, but that effect soon faded. Mm. So um, there may be initial responses and then things fade as as people sort of mm. uh, sense adapt to that. Mm. Yeah. Any more comments on that, Rachel, for the next question? Um, no. Okay, so the next question, question is from Mary. It says, hi, Rachel, both your examples of good emails have been quite feel-good topics mm. how to make it good when you need to ask people to do something about quite a difficult or complex issue mm. that's a uh, it's a very good question and uh, we did have examples of good emails that are on a, a difficult or complex email uh, issue and one of them was the email from some of us about the pulse nightclub shooting which is the most difficult and complex issue I can think of right now. And it focused on the human element, on the stories of individuals and on the reaction of the organization. So uh, if in doubt, always, always tell a story of one individual and what they think and what they went through. Uh, it seems that um, stories are the currency of human experience. It's the way we learn about the world. It's the way we form our relationships by telling each other stories. And we don't form relationships by telling each other statistics or informing each other about policy. So um, yeah, it, an email about a, an emotional issue or a, or a difficult one has to be narrative based. Uh, otherwise the response rate is, is low um, and uh, I, I look. I teach people in in the um, how to write emails get a to get a response course that is coming up. Um, I do a whole long section on how to construct a, a narrative that people will remember and share and retell and respond to. Okay, thanks, Rachel. So Iris has a question. Um, these are quite all quite picture heavy emails. Mm. I've heard everywhere that keeping emails very simple can work better as it looks closer to a normal human. Mm. Um, is that the case? What's mm. your recommendation on how much um, how much we should use images versus text? Mm. I love this question uh, because I, I also think that 
emails should be as close to uh, an email, that, the sort of email you would get from a friend as possible. So uh, this WWF email is heavily branded. Now that works in this instance because WWF is such a brilliant brand and people know the brand almost as if it is a friend. Uh, WWF is around in their lives. Um, it's it's positive. People like it. It has a cuddly panda as its logo. Um, it has a very strong voice and tone of voice. Um, and so people relate to that brand almost as if it was a person. They trust it. Um, however, if your brand is not so strong, then you do need to, it's not a household name, people don't relate to it as a, a carefully constructed personality, then you need to rely on the, um, on the individual send, send, sending the email and their personality and their character, their experiences and their story in order to draw your supporters into a really strong relationship. So in a sense, uh, this is this is slightly slightly misleading, uh, and you know for a lot of organisations you do need to reduce down the design paraphernalia and just focus on very simple elements. I mean, if you to be honest with you, if you took out the WWF logo, the um, the designed headers and the different type and different colours from this email. Uh, it would actually seem a lot more like a personal email from a friend, especially if that photo of the rhino and her baby were um, was embedded in between paragraphs of the text. And, you know, that, that's that's much more like the type of friend type of email a friend would send you after, you know, if they were introducing their new baby boy. Um, so that's in order to make this an ultimate email for a uh, a smaller brand that's what i would advise them to do and i'll add something there because i can <laughs> <laughs> um, i'll also add that it also depends on um on the purpose of the email so mm. i would say um a, something that looks like a plain text email um communicates urgency much better than does a highly designed email and mm. we, we've learned that you know design takes uh, time and effort um, and the more designed it is the less urgent it, it must be because uh, if it was urgent, we would have just got it out there fast. Mm. So especially for things like actions or things that are urgent, having something that's very, very simple probably communicates uh, more consistently the urgency of that than having something that's in a highly designed template. Even if that template actually takes you the same amount of time to implement as would be a, a sort of what looks like a plain text email. Um, so again, adapt it to, uh, in a sense, what message you want the form of it to convey. Mm really good advice so i have a, a question here from ben the watch video button will take people off the email does that suggest you should make sure it happens at the end mm, very good question uh i i don't think so uh i i think as long as you have some of the story from the email introduced on the page where a person can see the email i think i think you're all right um if there was a link to a video in an email which had a different call to action that would be a different story so you know if if this email was a call to action to sponsor the baby rhino then we would want to make sure that either we focus just on that call to action or we take people to the video page and then we have the call to action at the end of the video and below it on the page great thanks very much um, Sakshi has a question, which is, um, could you throw some light on the frequencies of emails coming from one organization, especially when the emails focused on CTA, so uh, call to action? I've heard emails every week can sometimes get too much, um, uh, uh, while elsewhere I've heard that weekly emails can maintain consistency. Mm. Yeah, uh, this is a, a, a very important question. So. Um, what I, we do know is that uh, Care2 and MailChimp teamed up to do a, a survey and some research into frequency of email and unsubscribe rate. And what they found was that monthly emails had a much, much higher, significantly higher 
uh, unsubscribe rate than weekly emails. And I think that is because if you have an email infrequently, what happens is you forget that you actually signed up to this organization in the first place. And when you have an email that you see for the first time in maybe three months, because you've missed all the others because they arrived at an inconvenient time or they arrived when you were overwhelmed with emails, then you, you look at it and you go, well, what's this? I didn't ask for this. And then you unsubscribe or, or worse, uh, you mark the email as spam. Uh, and, and that leads the organization into a vicious downward spiral where their, their emails aren't getting through. So they get through, you know, so they get marked as spam and they get through even less. Uh, and that's death for an email list. So sending weekly or fortnightly at the very least is actually quite important to minimize the unsubscribe rate. Um, now, uh, sometimes people can complain that they get too many emails. That's usually when the frequency of the emails becomes, you know, three or four times a week. Um, so it, it does it does depend on your list a little bit. Um, I know that during the Arctic 30 crisis, uh, people were clamoring for more information from Greenpeace, even though they were sending one or two emails a week about it. So they did an experiment where they put uh, they put the the most keen supporters on an email list where they got one email a day about the Arctic 30. Um, and that list was extremely, extremely high performing. They were having a regular uh, a consistent open rate of 50 percent. And that's one that's seven emails a week. So it may be worth splitting your list into keen beans and grumpy sods and then sending far higher frequency to the keen beans and a lower frequency to the grumpsters. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I would say once a week is, is rarely too much, though, rarely too much. The other thing to do is to look at the ratio of asks to warm, fuzzy emails. So. Um, if, if every time you get an email from an organization, they're asking you to do something, it feels like one of those friendships you have where it's really one sided and you dread hearing from that person. But if your ratio of asks to warm fuzzies is more like one to three, so you're for every email where you're asking for money or where you're asking the person to do something difficult, you send three emails that don't ask for something so heavy, uh, then you can maintain that really good relationship with your supporters. Fantastic. Thanks, Rachel. So Rebecca has a question. Can e-newsletters ever work or are standalone single issue or single ask emails always the best method? I think, well, I have heard from people that e-newsletters do work. Uh, I've not worked with an organization where a split test of an email newsletter has won over a standalone single issue email. Uh, that, that's just never happened to me in a split test. However, some organizations swear blind that they do. Uh, I think multiple ask emails work well if you have a trading arm and selling lots of different stuff. And not everyone will want to buy the, the main thing that you want to sell and you, you just give them an array of choices and then you'll generally get more people buying from that email. Um, there are there are certain instances where you just have far too much content and you need to combine two or three things in a newsletter to get it all out. Uh, I would and, and you, you have to do that out of necessity because you your email system isn't sophisticated enough to segment by area or by keenness of person. Uh, but in general, um, you know, if you if you have an e if you have an e newsletter and you've got something about an event in Edinburgh and a different event in London, and you've got a call to action on a petition, putting all those three things together, uh, you you're gonna get. Um, you're going to put off the people in Edinburgh very much by having a, a, an event in London in there. And um, once the people have clicked onto the event in Edinburgh, you, you've lost them. You're not going to get them to fill in the petition. So um, use newsletters very carefully uh, in, in the right in the right context. Great. OK, and the final question um, is from Erwan. Did I pronounce your name right, hopefully? 
Um, does that mean you should always say I in emails? I need your help versus rather than or rather than we need your help. Mm, good question. Uh, I think we is acceptable if if you are talking about the organization or you as the writer of the email plus your beneficiaries. Um, but it's, it's, it's important you make the we clear. So, um, you know, uh, I've been talking to workers in the Central African Republic, they're about to be hit by a drought, we need your help. Um, whereas, you know, if you're just sending as an organization and you're talking about when you say we it means collectively all the staff of that organization that's very depersonalizing so there's no blanket rule um, but it's important for me to know what we means because it could be you know you as the sender of the email and and me as the recipient we together uh, which is great uh, but it, it just needs to be clear fantastic thanks for that jessica has the last question here how would you segment keen beanness versus grumpy sadness <laughs> on the basis on open and click rates? Uh, I, I would I would say if you can always segment based on the number of people who actually took action. So um, a click rate could just be someone who's very curious uh, but doesn't actually ever do something or do anything. Um, it could be a, a, a rival organization. It could be a bot, you know, um, so always, always make that uh, segmentation by, um, you know, number of petitions signed, number of donations given, etc. If you aren't set up to track that stuff, then it definitely needs to be on the basis of click rate because open rate is really not accurate at all. Fantastic. So thanks very much, Rachel, for uh, volunteering to do this. Um, part of this is uh, also to promote um, Rachel's uh, course she has next month. I believe it's the uh, 8th of July, is it? That's, That's right. right. Yeah. Um, we uh, sort of are trying this method to because uh, it's really, really hard to try and get people to come to some of these courses uh, sort of, and without sort of spamming everyone all the time. So we wanted to also just try this method to see, does this pique your interest? Is this something that would also help you to get more uh, sort of training on and if not that's perfectly fine because uh, we're all helping or sharing our expertise as well mm -hmm. um, so what you'll get on the course is uh, a, a brainstorming method that you can use to help you write far better subject lines um, we'll be doing an email surgery so that you can submit an email and uh, then you know see what all participants think about it uh, we'll be looking at how to craft a really compelling story to get people taking action and we'll be discussing some ideas to uh, increase the forwarding rate um, stop your um, your unsubscribe rate creeping up lots there'll be lots and lots of ideas and uh, I would I would love you to come um, we have a uh, over a hundred pound discount which ends on Monday. So if you register now, you'll be able to take advantage of that saving for your organization. And uh, the course, unless we get a lot of participants, the course will be in my flat, which um, is a very relaxed atmosphere. Uh, and it's also a um, where the Olympic athletes stayed in during the Olympics. Um, and it's where we are right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, people, people find it a really, um, uh, really relaxing, chilled place with amazing, yummy food um, that I spoil you with. Fantastic. Well, thanks for everyone. Um, this is our first webinar. I hope to be doing some more. It's part of an experimentation process. So uh, I'll follow up with you as well to ask for feedback on what you thought about the quality of the audio, um, whether we could have done differently. I've already had about 10 ideas of how we can improve things as well. So um, really, really appreciate you being here. and. Uh, and yeah, I hope to see you on more webinars and of course on the ECF list and things like that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everyone. And we'll put the video up online as well, if it, if it works. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye. Bye.